Welcome back to the Gillette Health Podcast, where we give you tools to develop a balanced approach to health. I'm Dr. Kyle Gillette. And I'm James O'Hara, nurse practitioner. And today we have a highly requested topic, and one that I think is going to be a lot of fun to go through, and that is seed oils. So I really hadn't heard of seed oils until the last couple years where they were in the mainstream. And I was like, what the heck is everyone talking about? What's a seed oil? And I was like, oh, they're talking about vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, this is kind of an interesting concept and um, what most of you are probably wondering right off the bat is just skip straight to the point and are we pro seed oil, they're PUFAs, they're going to fix your health, or are we anti seed oils and should we demonize them and are they poison? And unfortunately, you probably won't hear that answer in, that pod in this podcast, but what you will hear is a lot of the nuance and a lot of the, I guess, good and bad science, we like to call it our non-systematic review on seed oils. Yeah, so I guess the typical story starts out with how seed oils are made. And like most processed things, processed foods, there's a lot of steps involved and it can sound very scary. And the term machine lubricant has also been making rounds. So seed oils, I, I suppose, were used as a machine lubricant. So if you want to keep your body running like a well-oiled machine, I suppose it's reasonable to use seed oils. Right? <laughs> I guess that's a very strange analogy. The other thing that we should mention is not all seed oils are equal. They have very different um, types of fats in them. As we mentioned in the hypothalamic amenorrhea podcast, some seed oils like canola oil, especially like a, you know, if you're talking to someone who's very anti-seed oil, you come up with a hyper extreme example of a seed oil that's likely not deleterious to health, cold espeller pressed canola oil. So an example of that is, you know, it doesn't have to be heated up to extremely high temperatures to extract it. it um, however, it's a very laborious process and you're not using a lot of other chemicals. So it's expeller pressed rather than uh, chemically separated. And on paper, canola oil's profile looks quite good. However, in the case of hypothalamic amenorrhea, it appeared that um, it was actually deleterious. Yeah, to the uh, the leptin production and of course mm -hmm. downstream of that leptin signaling. So that's a specific patient population where they may want to stay away from those products that have a higher linoleic acid content. And I think that's the common theme yep. in what people consider a you know quote unquote unhealthy seed oil is that this oil has more linoleic acid. Whereas something like, you know, butter has a very low linoleic acid content, much more, you know, saturated and monounsaturated fat. Yeah. Um, and it's not really a, it's not a fair trade in this case. So if you're trading, uh, for example, canola oil for butter, it is not necessarily good because saturated fat also has downsides that seed oils don't. So we'll get into this a little bit, um, but uh, I guess like any true scientist, where do we start? The yeah. highest quality of evidence, so in vitro data. <laughs> yeah, and this study is particularly interesting <laughs> because it's not just in vitro data, but it's in vitro data of not human cells, but mice cells. So we know that studies in mice don't always translate to the human findings. Mm -hmm. And I would suspect that you're going to see an even lower percent of in vitro mouse cell data translate into human data. But I'll just go ahead and read the um, uh, excerpt from the conclusion here. It says, in vitro, um, ox lambs, which are oxidized linoleic acid metabolites. So these ox lambs induce- Scary. It, that sounds very <laughs> scary. Based on that alone, some people have decided to cut seed oils out. But it says these ox lambs have induced hepatocyte cell death, which was partly dependent on Caspase 1 activation. This study identified key mechanisms by which dietary ox lambs contribute to NASH development, non alcoholic. Um, what is that again? Steatohepatitis. So non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, now we call it non alcoholic steatohepatitis right. instead. So. Yep. Including mitochondrial dysfunction, hepatocyte <laughs> death, and NLRP3 inflammasome activation. So that all sounds pretty scary. What do you think would happen if we gave this to people who were already obese and on their way to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis? So if we take this shining stellar um, evidence-based article and apply it to humans, you would think for sure it would carry over. But when you look at 
um, studies in obese individuals, and if you give them um, a very similar dietary regimen, then you don't really see the same result. Yeah, and in fact, when they gave people, um, they basically broke it down into a, I believe it was soybean oil, something with a high linoleic acid content compared to a higher diet of saturated fatty acids. They actually saw that the fat in the liver decreased in response to a higher intake of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So you know, actually quite the opposite of what the in vitro mouse data showed. Yeah, so the one of the big concepts to remember here is they compared it to saturated fat. And whether it's saturated fat from tropical oils like palm oil or coconut oil or saturated fat from animal sources, in cases of NAFLD and in cases of um, uh, lipoproteins like ApoB, the, uh, the opportunity cost of giving up seed oils is often a diet that is increased in saturated fat content. And we know that in most people with metabolic syndrome, limiting saturated fat to a certain amount of calories per day, and I forget the exact equation, but in general, lipidologists recommend, um, like let's say there's uh, someone who's consuming uh, 1800 or 2000 calorie diet, because they're trying to lose body fat, then that's somewhere around 10 to 15 grams of saturated fat per day, which is a pretty low amount. So if you can only have 10 to 15 grams of saturated fat combined, what else are you gonna eat? Non-saturated yeah. fat. It, and that's what people have to ask, like whenever you're talking about a dietary change, if I tell people, we'll just eliminate this and eliminate that, they're probably gonna pick the tastiest thing that I tell them not to eliminate. So. Yep. They can cut saturated fat quite low, but if they're replacing that with like processed carbohydrates or high sugar content foods, then that's probably not going to do a lot to improve their overall health, how they're mm -hmm. feeling, or their you know cardiac risk profile. Speaking of overall health and how they're feeling, are there people with very low seed oil contents in their diet that are very healthy, that feel great, that um, don't need to change anything that they're doing? Yeah, I would say that I'm one of those people. I tend to prioritize monounsaturated fats mm -hmm. and I do consume an amount of saturated fat more so socially versus in my everyday mm -hmm. life. But I feel like I don't have a high omega-6 intake, not necessarily because I'm afraid of seed oils, but yeah. just because I don't tend to you know, stir fry things or cook with a lot of oils. And I, I tend to use avocado oil just because you know it's convenient and we're aware of a organic source where we get that. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very pragmatic approach. Um, certainly not possible for an individual that lives in a food desert. So probably not possible for a large majority of Americans. Um, your, what I'd call balanced take <laughs> or individualized take um, is kind of similar to what I hear from our friend Simon Hill, where he's, he talks about some of the potential benefits of PUFA versus saturated fat. But then he also says that he doesn't consume a very high amount of PUFAs in his diet. Yeah, but he has a very low amount of saturated fat and a very, like, as close to a heart healthy diet as you can get, um, you know, having a lot of those whole plant based foods, not a lot of animal products. Mm -hmm. So it, there's an individualized approach for everyone. And the question is, you know, what are you going to be able to sustain? Like, what's a sustainable eating pattern for you? And a lot of times that's individualized. People don't like to eat the same things. It's like you can write someone the perfect diet that's going to lower ApoB. And those diets actually work a lot better in hospital wards than they do when people leave the hospital. It's strange, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, uh, it must be not because of adherence, right? I think it's that the LDL particles are scared of hospitals, so they won't even show up in the blood work there. Yeah, they're scared of the nosocomial infections. <laughs> <laughs> As they should be. Uh, in any case, so I guess the, um, the point a lot of people make is that these linoleic acids are unstable compared to saturated fat. And I think that statement by itself is true. They are less stable fats by nature. But how significant is that? So they'll say, well, you know, maybe the problem isn't seed oils. They'll concede a little bit, right? You know, you, you talk about the cold impeller press seed oils. Yep. Like, those are minimally processed, um, probably not oxidized if they've been well stored. So they say, well, the problem is when you heat it. So if you're cooking something with vegetable oil, it's going to oxidize and you're going to get trans fats. Which, you know, trans fats are scary. There's a Agreed. large database there. There's a reason that those are 
either eliminated or in very small quantities in our diet yep. now. So when we look at some of the trans fat studies, um, this was an interesting one. I, I picked it because they prepared ginger snap cookies and zucchini cake, uh, two of my favorite healthy foods. Hmm. And let's see what happened. So canola oil was used as the main fat ingredient. Zucchini cake and gingerbread cookies were baked at 180 and 200 degrees Celsius. They also prepared stir fried chicken at 200 and 275 degrees Celsius. The lipids from the food were extracted, blah, 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 and they were assessing the trans fatty acids. And they concluded that baking and stir frying at normal and or extreme temperatures did not significantly affect the amount of trans fats. Hmm. How'd they get trans fats in Crisco then? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently well, not. What's by that process where degree? they make the fat hard? I, I heard that mentioned over and over again in the seed oil podcast that I listened to preparing for this. Yeah. There's a process where you make the fat into a hard substance. It sounds like hydrogenation, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of interesting when um, and this is kind of a clinically directed podcast or after hours podcast is um, directed like truly at the layman and with minimal clinical terms and jargon as possible. Um, not that you have to be a clinician or a scientist to listen to this, to listen to the non after hours podcast. But um, when we do other podcasts, I do my best to talk in layman's terms. Um, but it's interesting that uh, an expert in uh, fats, I guess a self-proclaimed lipidologist would say making the fat hard or making the fat hard because fats that are solid at room temperature are not necessarily bad. You could almost make a case. It reminds me of the discussion regarding grains. Mm, yeah. It's about the degree of processing. So your rule of thumb is the more processed. So if you're hydrogenating a fat in order to change it from liquid to a fat at room temperature, or extruding to extremely, extremely high heat or going to extreme measures, then you are more likely, just like it's more likely that ultra processed foods are going to be more harmful to your health. Yeah, and there's an abundance of data to support that. I think that's the one thing that everyone in the nutrition space agrees on is that ultra yep. processed foods really do not have a positive health, like any positive health effects in the general population. I, I, I've made the case that perhaps there are some elite athletes who need like yep. a very high number of calories. And the only way that they're going to get those in is by eating some processed foods, you know, like Michael Phelps, for example, yep. eating you know, however many Subway sandwiches he was per day. Yeah. That's a lot of processed food, but clearly he had good metabolic health and great athletic performance. But the average person is not spending eight hours in a pool exercising every day. Yeah. Although I kind of, I feel like a person that's an elite athlete. So maybe I need ultra processed foods. <laughs> um, of note, yes, some seed oils would be considered ultra processed. Yeah, this is true. Um, going back, I guess, circling around to the, the trans fats again, there is another study here that found a bit of trans fat that developed whenever they were specifically stir frying in corn oil. But the amount of that was still less than 1% of the total fat content. So mm. there was about a, you know, a quarter of a percent that was found in just raw corn oil, even after it was baked, after it was pan fried, after it was deep fried, and then stir frying, they found that that went from a total of about you know, a quarter of a percent to about 1% between the two fatty acids they were looking for there. So people are probably getting some trans fats, but it's not a significant amount. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good takeaway. And then we get into the trials that people like to talk about in humans. So if we talk about our you know, evidence of hierarchy, uh, we made a joke about the foundation of that being the in vitro data. Yeah, when, to the top of the pyramid <laughs> of evidence-based medicine. And then if you look at uh, this, which was a randomized clinical trial in humans. Mm. That's the bottom of the pyramid of evidence-based medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, basically, they randomized these patients to products that were higher in um, you know, saturated fats or the saturated fat substitutes of the time. Mm -hmm. And in 1968, you know, we can reason that there is a high chance that there were a lot of trans fats yes. in the saturated fat substitutes, vegetable spreads, and so forth at the time. So this is the study that everyone likes to cite, and there's 
so many confounders here that it's hard to make anything out of the data because you know trans fats you know you can say oh well that skewed the vegetable oil data and also you know these patients were intended to be followed inpatient with strictly controlled dietary regimens during the treatment period and that didn't happen because also yep. in the late 1960s and 1970s you had a lot of these mental institutions shutting down yep. releasing people back um, into society and then you know the data is going to be confounded by that so they did find that in this case you know 41% of the participants in the intervention group, meaning those that were not eating saturated fat or eating less saturated fat, um, had at least one MI, myocardial infarction, whereas only 22% of the participants in the control group did. So it was about twice as many events in the intervention group. And if you told me that, oh yeah, there was trans fats in that, I, I really wouldn't be surprised hmm. because we know that those are very detrimental you would think they're very detrimental, or were the trans fats behind what took these individuals that were permanently institutionalized in mental institutions and um, healed them to a point where they are able to just walk around society with no deleterious outcomes. But uh, <laughs> then, <laughs> then again, on a serious note, yeah, not a lot of takeaways that you can take from that other than, uh, I suppose, uh, trans fats are not great, but we already knew that. Yeah, and this was the Minnesota coronary experiment for people that want to go and, and read a bit about this. Uh, another famous experiment out of Minnesota that I like to mention when people talk about, you know, seed oils and causing obesity, and you'll see these charts with the calorie intake of Americans now and then the trend of obesity. So you'll see the calorie intake, and it's like a flat line at 3,000 or 3,500 calories per day. Is about the average is what they estimate. People may be underreporting their calories, uh, but then at the same time on that graph, you see that obesity is continuing to go up. People's average weight is going up despite eating the same number of calories. So you're like, what's happening here? If you go back to the Minnesota <laughs> starvation experiments, and these are from the 1940s, I believe. I, you couldn't do these studies today. Shout out to Minnesota for all these wild studies. <laughs> yeah, lots of great data coming out of Minnesota. Um, Is that where the Milgram experiment was too? I don't recall. I don't we'll remember. have to look that up. Yeah. Anyway. But the maintenance intake for these men placed on these starvation diets, their maintenance calorie intake was about 3,200 calories per day. And they were not obese. So clearly they were burning a lot more calories than the average American is today. The so-called starvation diets that they got put on were between 1,600 and 1,800 calories. So that was their starvation diet, which caused a lot of psychological distress. Mm -hmm. And you see the same sort of thing whenever people go into a calorie deficit now, where you know, the same psychological characteristics, they kind of become you know, fixated around like their meals and the next time they're going to eat. I mean, they're preparing for a bodybuilding competition yep. is a great example of this and can be a catalyst for some people to go into a pattern of disordered eating. Yep, certainly true. Um, any extreme diet is going to, uh, by the way, the definition of a VLCD, an extreme diet, would probably be different. So if you go from 3,200 calories to 1,600 calories, that's a huge drop. If you go from 2,000 calories to 12,000 calories, that is a different huge drop. In general, in obesity medicine, calories of, you know, a, certainly a 1,200 calorie diet would be considered a VLCD, very low calorie diet. And um, a diet like that requires physician oversight because of the harms and sequelae that are expected to come out of it and the huge rebound that is also expected to come out of it. Um, again, causing things like disordered eating. Exactly. So, you know, these sorts of things really should be, you know, if they're taking it to a, you know, I think more extreme, they should be managed by someone who knows what they're doing, someone who's an expert in the field, ideally someone certified in obesity medicine. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the, the timeline here. So, you know, 1944, uh, for those that are wondering, is when the Minnesota starvation experiment occurred. So in the 60s to 80s, based on what I was able to find, it was, it's really unclear from those years how much trans fat exactly was in the food supply. Um, but it was probably a substantial amount. And that's, again, around the time that the Minnesota coronary experiments were happening. Also, 1963, we reached our peak cigarette consumption as a nation. Hmm, that and sounds like a confounder. 
This is a big problem. So 1960s is actually the decade where like, heart attack rates peaked. So you'll hear people with this, you know, pseudo messaging talking about how now people are having more heart attacks than ever. People are having worse heart health. And that's just simply not true. Our prevention has actually gotten a lot better, but unfortunately it still is, you know, the number one killer. And yep. most people will have a vascular event at some point in their life as of the time we're recording this. Yeah, that's not great odds. And it's one reason why cardiovascular disease prevention and ASCBD prevention should be at the top of your preventive med and health optimization list. Your car is not going to care if it has a turbo if all the systems clog and die. And uh, you can't just put a new engine in a human yet. Um, so that's some things to think about. Anyway, 60s to 80s, trans fat peak. That's why pie crusts were so good back then. Whenever you cook with trans fats, it just has the most crispy, perfect crust ever. <laughs> but it's just not worth it. I'm going to try not to think about it. Grandma's crust is just not, so good. We're not crust to die for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost nothing is worth dying for, including trans fat based crust. So um, 1963 was peak smoking. 1964 was the first uh, public announcement that cigarettes are harmful. That's wild. That's so recent. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, around the year that, you know, my, my father was born looking mm -hmm. back, you know, so, you know baby dad O'Hara, you know, that's about the time that we realized, oh, maybe we shouldn't be telling people to smoke or that smoking mm -hmm. is harmful. And like you mentioned, this is a huge confounder if you're looking at like the, all the swaps and changes that happened in a public health sense at the time. So you have at the same time this push towards, again, 1960s, 70s, 80s, a push towards not smoking, a push mm -hmm. towards more heart healthy oils, which yep. in that time frame may not have truly been more heart healthy. And then it's just kind of, you know, confounded all the data. So we don't know exactly what public health change is associated with which outcome. Um, fortunately, and I suppose we could say fortunately for the data, not fortunately for the people. Fortunately for the data, the first statin was not invented until 1987, at which time you see a dramatic drop in rates of vascular events. Because they were dropping dead of other things before they had a vascular event. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's interesting. Uh, of course, we know that statins uh, poison your testosterone supply. They they might decrease your total testosterone by up to, uh, up what, to five, ten. up to 10. Up to 10 nanograms per deciliter. Probably just five nanograms per deciliter. So your uh, total of 245 might go down to 235. With a statin. Yeah. And that's with the high intensity longer. statins. So if you're looking at like, there's very few people who in today's society with the options we have available mm -hmm. would really require a high intensity statin, especially if you're looking at someone for primary prevention yep. that is concerned with their testosterone. Yep. So you've, you can use a moderate intensity rosuvastatin yep. plus Zetia or Zetamibe and get a very dramatic lowering and the same outcome data mm -hmm. as if you had someone on a high intensity statin. Yep. There's also the PCSK9 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a ton of options there. So yep, the, those are definitely great options. Bimpedoic acid now, um, and there's multiple non-lipophilic statins. There's a lot of good options for uh, primary prevention of atherosclerosis, but just taking a statin doesn't mean you can, doesn't mean you, well, you still can, but should you eat as much saturated fat and seed oils in your diet as you'd like? Obviously not. Yeah, I suppose it will help from the atherosclerosis standpoint, but if you become like diabetic enough or smoke enough or hypertensive enough, yep. then you know, all bets are going to be off. And as we saw, like perhaps with more saturated fat, if you're inactive at high risk, you could develop more fat in the liver more yep. quickly from more saturated fatty acids. Yeah. Um, one, I guess one pretty common question is, well, what should I avoid or what should I include in the diet? And what should I include in moderation? What should I include in small amounts? People ask about cholesterol content. People ask about seed oil content. And people ask about saturated fat. Um, where does the balance fall for those three things for most people? So what should people do? There's many different approaches here. Basically, the question I ask is, how proactive do you want to be when it comes to cardiovascular prevention? Uh, is somebody at a you know one out of ten? They want to be very natural. They don't want to make a lot of dietary changes. They're 
really not concerned about cardiovascular disease at that risk level. Most of our patients don't fall over there. Most people yep. say they want to be somewhere moderate, five or six out of 10, or they want to be like 10 out of 10 preventive. And then the question is, okay, you know, do you want to make moderate diet changes, extreme diet changes? Are you open to medication, supplementation? Most people say that they're very open to diet changes, but it's very hard to maintain a rigid pattern of eating, especially with a, probably like we said before, the most heart healthy diet is going to be probably a low fat plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem the most palatable. That's not the diet that I abide by. So perhaps someone who's not willing to do that in combination with medications, maybe they're at a nine out of 10. Mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, I'll, I'll take a medication and lower my atherogenic potential. Mm -hmm. So they're not truly 10 out of 10 unless they're also saying, you know, I'm going to eat the heart healthy diet too. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, is that going to translate to you know, five more years of a health span? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. By the way, definition of atherogenic particle would be your non-HDL and your LDL because both of those can contain apolipoprotein B or ApoB, just a, on the side. Yeah, and we followed like a number of things. Like the, one of the very first things we tell our patients when they enter our practice is, hey, we think that blood pressure and endothelial health are very important. So what does your blood pressure typically run? Do you have a home blood pressure cuff? If not, go get one. Because that's a huge factor and many people this will sneak up on. Um, other things we look at, the genetic lipoprotein A, mm -hmm. Uh, this is something I found interesting with the bimpedoic acid, even though it decreased events, which is the outcome we want, it does have the side effect of raising uric acid, which yeah. is interesting because uric acid is also correlated with an increase in events, but obviously it's a smaller risk factor if someone's like, oh, I want to address my uric acid, but they don't want to address their LDL of 180, they kind of need to realign priorities. So we should write a book, Spike Your Acid. <laughs> There's a correlation in patients that are on pimpadoic acid that have less cardiovascular disease and they also have higher uric acid. Thus, higher uric acid must lead to less cardiovascular disease. If you look at some of the graphs that are put together, looking at causes and potential causes of obesity, things that happened in the 1970s and the rate of obesity now, that's the same logic people are using. You know, they're like, oh, well, seed oil consumption has gone up since then. You know, Rubik's cube use has also gone up since the 1970s when it was invented. So mm -hmm. yeah, maybe that's the cause of obesity if we're just talking about correlations. Just to be safe, I don't use Rubik's cubes. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yep. Uh, but there's a number of medications that do this. So like the SGLT2s, SGLT2s, for example, they're going to raise LDL a little bit, which sounds like a terrible idea for heart disease. But in the context of someone with generally uncontrolled diabetes, mm -hmm that lowering of the A1C and the reduction in hyperglycemia is actually cardioprotective. It has a net positive, even if you're shuffling something around. And people that are on an SGL2 are also usually going to be on a statin medication mm -hmm. that's going to reduce risk. There's some degree independent of the amount of LDL lowering, some of those pleiotropic effects on endothelial function and inflammation that statins also have. Mm -hmm. um, and those are Pleiotrophic, those are benefits that that's not a harm that statin causes. Some people will conflate statins with harm, so I want to be clear there. Yeah, that's a good delineation. Maybe instead of our scale model of weighing benefits and detriments for deciding what when to utilize pharmacotherapy, instead we need to use a meme template where it's like a it's a game show. You give up uh LDL. Your LDL goes up by 10, but in return, you get an A1C from 8 to 7. Hmm. People might um, be more receptive to or understand the trade-offs of medication slightly better. Uh, I might like a little more A1C lowering for that kind of an LDL trade-off. Is there any bartering involved here? Uh, I suppose you could uh, barter with the dose or barter <laughs> with the frequency. For example, Let's say that it's an individual that has foreskin or an individual with two X chromosomes. You might not want to dose the SGLT2 every day. You might want to pulse it or give them a bit of a rest. That sounds for like an risk. individualized approach. Yeah, this is another darn individualized approach. Somebody is going to make a drinking game every time we say individualized. Rats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
That's Everybody's a bit of an inside joke, but um, some people may find that funny. Yeah, regarding yeah. the preclinical data, by the way, yeah. that's the inside joke. And statins, they increase lipoprotein little a, but lower cardiovascular events. Yeah, another inconvenience. So you think if LP little a increases, that is going to um, lead to more heart attacks and strokes. But paradoxically, if you look up the guidelines for individuals with high lipoprotein little a, usually defined over 75, certainly 100 and over, the first line of treatment is getting on statin, which raises your lipoprotein little a. But you know things are out there that do lower lipoprotein little a, especially things that you eat. <sighs> yes, I suppose so. Um, my favorite thing personally that lowers lipoprotein Protein little a is synthetic androgens and synthetic estrogens, both. But that's something we'll have to save for another podcast because this is the seed oil podcast, not the synthetic hormone podcast. I suppose we need a synthetic androgen podcast. Yeah, we usually tie in um, hormones in some way, whether they're, they're synthetic or bioidentical. Um, yes, TRT uh, can lower lipoprotein little a. But uh, like anything else, um, dietary sources, food is medicine. Uh, please debate us if you do not think food is medicine. Um, but yeah, I guess if you have a high level protein little a, then you add in saturated fat, right? That's right. I listened to a number of seed oil claims and podcasts and looked up citations. And I'll just pull this chart up for you here. So this was the lipoprotein little a reduction that was found in I, I don't even think we should look at the trans fat section here because no one is going to argue eating more trans fats is a positive intervention. So let's just say oleic acid versus saturated fatty acids. You have a difference of about two milligram per deciliter. So yes, it's statistically significant, but is that going to make any difference in a patient's cardiovascular outcomes? No. It's a good example of statistical significance, but not clinical significance. And again, uh, scientists out there, you know this, and statisticians know this, with a high enough sample size, lots of things will start to look sign statistically significant. Um, but um, yeah, I, I would not add in saturated fat just to decrease your lipoprotein little a. That is certainly not worth it. Yeah, and you mentioned TRT and, and cardiac risk there. Uh, TRT lowering lipoprotein little a by optimizing androgens if someone's mm -hmm. going from a very low starting point. What if your TRT is in a seed oil? Yeah, um, that would likely still work just as well. Um, there's a lot of carrier oils for TRT. And again, we'll have a, a, a podcast just on TRT if we haven't already and a podcast just on synthetic androgens themselves. Um, probably multiple. We're doing multiple peptide podcasts as well. But um, one thing to keep in mind is there, uh, there's actionable items of things that can lower lipoprotein little a. For some people, aspirin does a good job. Make sure not to use expired aspirin because it converts to salicylic acid. Um, and another good option would be, for some people, L-carnitine has the potential to lower lipoprotein little a. The data on that's not as great as aspirin, <clears throat> but most of the things are very weak, like 10 or 20%. PSC K9 inhibitors can lower lipoprotein little a up to 30%, and so can Lecvio, which is basically works on the mRNA right before PSCK9. So um, there are certainly things that can lower lipoprotein little a by a little bit. And I've seen in my own blood work, my lipoprotein little a went from 100 to 20. So I'm pretty happy with the various interventions that have helped with that. Yeah, that's cool. That's a more substantial reduction than you would be led to believe is possible based on the guidelines that are out there. Um, and when we're looking at you know, the lowering of lipoprotein little a, you mentioned niacin there. And I know we've talked about this on a podcast before, but we would really like to see some data on a, let's call it a, a form of you know, niacin or an analog of sorts, NMN or NR, mm -hmm. where you can potentially get lipoprotein little a lowering. It's not clear if that happens or not. Yep. But the advantage there is you don't have the potential liver toxicity and you don't have the diabetogenic effect where you may tip someone towards insulin resistance. Yep. If anything, the you know, NMN and NR may have a mild insulin sensitizing effect. And I want to emphasize it's mm -hmm. very mild. Mild. Yeah. It's like the picture of the Cheeto in the door lock. Uh, the <laughs> lifestyle interventions are the battering ram smashing down the door. That's your caloric excess. That's your ultra processed foods, your sugars, your lack of exercise. 
that's metabolic syndrome battering ram and your NMN is the little Cheeto stomping it. But it is a mild insulin sensitizer. So um, not to delineate into that too much. Uh, niacin can also cause flushing. So it's not great for patient adherence. Um, let us know if you know of any study looking at NMN, which is the down. So niacin converts to nicotinamide riboside, which is NR, which converts to nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is NMN, which converts to NAD+. So we're very interested in if those more tolerable supplements can lower lipoprotein little a. And of course, we're looking at anecdotal evidence very closely, but we'd still love to see even something like a case study or a case control published. Yeah, so even if you, there's tons of people taking these things now. So if someone has taken this, measured it LP little a, measured it again, you know, let us know if you saw any changes in that marker. I suppose we couldn't have an individualized seed oil podcast without talking about genetics a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I see cited every once in a while. And usually when people are being more reasonable about discussing, like, are seed oils harmful? Are they inflammatory? And the answer to almost every question in health and medicine is it depends. So when it comes to genetics, are seed oils harmful or helpful? Yeah, it can be both. So I don't, I don't know if I'd say helpful, but there are certainly um, genotypes where, and we can even pull up this graph here mm -hmm. if you want to see for yourself, but there are certainly genotypes where your CRP can raise by, I believe about 0.5 to one. Um, and uh, you know, not necessarily everybody has to check their genotype for this. Um, precision genomic medicine is where things are going, and we are certainly interested in this. So if you're a PhD or an MD or a DO in heavily into clinical genomics or another applicable field like pharmacogenomics or pharmacology, um, add us on LinkedIn. We'd love to have a conversation, especially if you have insight into where things are going, but not to rabbit trail too much. Um, for some people, yes, seed oils can raise acute phase reactants, which are inflammatory markers and potentially be deleterious in even moderate amounts. Yeah, so it's not a huge amount. And the interesting thing is here, when you look at you know, heter the homozygous with the CC and heterozygous with the TT allele, you can see that some people actually, when they added in these seed oils or linoleic acid intake, they actually had a drop, a similar drop in their level of CRP. So for that person, it's anti-inflammatory. Hmm. And the opposite, when you see the CC genotype, looks like they had about a half point increase, maybe up to one point increase in their C-reactive protein. So this is where you may you know, consider investigating if someone does have kind of a refractory or a mystery, low-grade systemic inflammation, just not adding up. They're very insulin sensitive. They're exercising. They're doing all the right things. You don't see any clear cause of this. I mean, you could test for this gene. You could get some whole genome sequencing. Yeah. Um, or you could, you know, run a trial and say, hey, like, let's say this person's a, this person's a linoleic acid enthusiast, a seed oil enthusiast. Yeah. I put canola on everything instead of hot sauce. <laughs> then we may say, hey, let's go ahead and, you know, cut that out and let's prioritize monounsaturates for a while mm -hmm. and just see what happens because there is a possibility that they have this genotype. Yeah, that's a good takeaway. Um, and even if somebody doesn't have that genotype, then if they're concerned, then prioritizing monounsaturated for a while and things like dietary fiber and micronutrient density is very reasonable that you can do with anybody without ruining patient physician rapport. This example kind of reminds me of MCT oil. So we've already done our fat podcast, so check that out if you're interested. But there is genotypes like lipoprotein lipase deficiencies or um, insufficiencies that respond quite well to MCT oil because it's not as well incorporated in chylomicrons. Um, but it's just another example. Uh, you know, it, the best diet is, yes, one that you can adhere to, but an individualized diet is ideal. <clears throat> yeah, and people have foods that they like, foods that they don't like. You know, you have to find a balance. It, you can restrict a diet to where, like, it's not going to be enjoyable for someone. And in fact, when people eat the same foods over and over again, Sometimes this can be used as a tool for dieting. You kind of lose that dopamine from the novelty of the food you're eating. It's the same thing day after day. It's not very exciting and your appetite kind of goes down a little bit because it's mm -hmm. just, you know, not as exciting. There's no novelty to it. Yep. Some people that works well for other people, you know, they say, I could never sustain that. That's just not the way I want to live my life. Yep. So we don't tend to spend our time arguing with patients about the seed oils that they eat or do not eat. We find that there's you know better uses for our time, more actionable ways to help people with their health. Um, just like we don't 
you know, scream about, you know, thermodynamics, calories in, calories out. Yeah, you know, there's it's just it's not worth it. You're arguing physics. It's not an actionable takeaway. Yeah. There's bigger fish to fry, just not in <laughs> seed oil, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> rats <laughs> and bigger rats to fry. Um, but yeah, another one of my takeaways is um, find something that the patient can tolerate, even if it comes to, uh, you know, some people have been avoiding seed oils for a while, even if the evidence changes and they even change their mind, they just don't like having a diet high in seed oils. And as long as their labs and biomarkers look good, that's their in of one in vitro or in vivo case study, yeah. <laughs> not, not really in vitro, <laughs> but that's okay to continue that diet. So I'm not going to change their diet just because of that. You know, their CRP looks great. Um, their hormones look great. And the same thing of someone who is um, a potential canola oil enthusiast, um, as long as everything looks good. Um, and yes, that might include a CCTA. So let's say there's a patient who's 55 and let's say they're a saturated fat enthusiast. There are saturated fat enthusiasts yes. out there. And they are a statin unenthusiast, whatever the word for that is, then yes, that very well might um, include a CCTA. So there are certainly people that are saturated fat enthusiasts and that are statin unenthusiasts. And um, I am very interested in the CCTA of those so-called lean mass hyper responders around age 50 or age 60, because between age 20 and 40, it's not really gonna mean a whole lot. You, uh, now, you might have progression of plaque on a CCTA, but I would be very interested to see that and know when a 45 year old saturated fat enthusiast posts their clean calcium score, um, I'm not very uh, convinced by that. Like Shania Twain would say, that don't impress me much. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so I guess it's pretty clear at this point that we have a fairly neutral take on seed oils, like take them or leave them. Yeah, it's not a staple of my diet. I don't think it needs to be a staple for everyone. Mm -hmm. Certainly some people you know, will enjoy a higher fat, lower carb diet, and they choose to use polyunsaturated fats and they do just fine. So I guess the question that we should ask is what evidence would we want to see or what kind of a study should be run if we wanted to either solidify our opinion or if we wanted to you know, kind of do a 180 and say, hey, we think that you know, seed oils and linoleic acid in particular is just deleterious for human health. So yeah. what does that study look like to you? Not an in vitro study on rat cells, <laughs> that's for sure. It'd probably look like a, a randomized controlled trial um, for as many years as feasible, whether that's two or 10, 30 is probably not very feasible. And um, actually accounting for confounding variables like the Minnesota coronary experiment did not. And you pick the um, you know, the least confounding oil. So not an oil that's been, um, you know, heavily processed, perhaps a cold expeller pressed one. You standardize the um, lino linic and linoleic acid contents um, to something that you can agree upon and then compare that to uh, maybe saturated fat, but not high in trans fat. That seems like a reasonable experiment to start with. And then you would have to provide, I guess, all the food for all 200 participants in the study for all those years and then also make sure that they adhere to that. Yeah, and the approach I would take, maybe this study is a little bit more feasible, um, would be kind of similar to the Minnesota coronary experiment and also similar to the way they're looking at these siRNA therapies for lipoprotein A now. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at people for secondary prevention. These are high risk populations. So you're more likely to detect a signal earlier versus you know running a 20 year, 30 year study. Um, it's called a five-year study, something like that. And in an environment like, you know, an inpatient center, if you can well randomize those groups and account for medications that increase risks, metabolic syndrome, mm -hmm. cardiovascular events, you know, the psychiatric medications are not particularly benign when it comes to metabolic effects. But if you could randomize a group very well at the outset of this, then you could potentially have those patients having all the food provided. Um, and then you have one group that's, of course, you know, high omega sixes versus, you know, high saturated fat. And you follow and see what happens. You know, maybe you start with a baseline CCTA. Yep. That certainly wasn't around at the time of the Minnesota coronary experiment. Mm -hmm. And then you can follow those, you know, serially for one year. And if you see a signal of harm, you're probably going to pull the plug on that experiment before the five year mark. 
because it would be unethical mm -hmm. to continue to expose people to a harmful intervention, regardless of whether it's saturated fat or the omega-6s, they would see causing the harm. So yeah. this is just hypothetical, but that's sort of the study I would look at. And I think the most important part there is randomizing the groups well at the beginning, because mm -hmm. we've seen time and time again, when we're looking at these studies, they may be randomized trials, but um, I guess we would have to look at them and be like, we want a well-randomized trial. Yeah. Most of these trials are well designed in that they are designed to show a specific outcome. Yeah. And they I guess are well randomized <laughs> because they're randomized to show a specific outcome. I saw one um, retrospective study and the group that was um, retrospectively endorsed eating seed oils and not animal oil had twice the rate of obesity and twice the rate, twice as many overweight participants. So that was well randomized. So it was randomized. And I guess that's a question that peer reviewers asked, right? Well, was the trial randomized? It's like, yes. The follow-up question should be, was it well randomized? <laughs> and that answer would be no. The same thing with like, oh, well, we controlled for this variable. It's like, okay, you controlled for it, but did you control for it well? And that answer would also be no in a lot of cases. Yeah. They attempted to make the shot, but they didn't attempt very well. So, yeah. And this is what we like to think of, you know, like the evidence that would make us like question what we currently believe and advise. And um, if we go all the way back to cigarettes, right? You know, we used to recommend those things for patients mm -hmm. with asthma, uh, not myself and you personally, but the medical personnel from like early 1900s was like, oh yeah, cigarettes for asthmatic relief. You can find pictures of this on Google. You can see it in medical museums. Uh, now I think you will find zero medical professionals out there recommending cigarettes for asthmatic relief. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> there may be some contrarians that are. Hopefully you have uh, derived a lot of tools to have a balanced approach to health in this episode. And uh, hopefully you found it enjoyable. As always, thank you for your time and may God give you health and happiness. Mm -hmm.